Hello folks and welcome to the Non-Diet Yogi Podcast where we explore yoga, earth-based living and gentle nutrition through a non-diet lens. I'm your host Casey Conroy, non-diet dietitian, naturopath in training and yoga teacher and in this episode I interviewed dietitian and personal trainer Monique Jeffcoat about Gym culture without weight loss challenges, bringing health at every size, intuitive eating and body positivity into fitness. We all know that living an active lifestyle is beneficial to our health. Bodies are meant to move and ideally to move with joy. But the line between healthy and unhealthy fitness can be thin. Like so many other arenas, diet culture has well and truly infiltrated the fitness scene and gym goers can easily find themselves sacrificing their mental health in their pursuit of physical fitness. Gym culture can be incredibly toxic for people already struggling with body image and eating concerns, but it can also be where these problems begin. The line separating the desire to be fit Um, from spiraling into an eating disorder is an easy and dangerous one to cross. Within gyms, you'll see pretty regular, well, most gyms, you'll see pretty regular bikini body and 12-week weight loss challenge um, challenges that are facilitated by most of these gyms. um, And these challenges perpetuate the unspoken belief that fitness should be prioritized above all else. These challenges are often very cheap and are used to reel people in to sign up to the gym. They work by selling people on the premise that weight loss and improved fitness will confer the happiness, health, social status and love that most people are seeking. Fitspo is further fuel for the gym culture fire. And not unlike Thinspo, which is used to, do, to encourage eating disorders, Fitspo is a social media phenomenon that uses imagery and phrases to inspire physical fitness. Although fitness advocates um, tend to be quick to differentiate the two, both Fitspo and in, um, Thinspo are eerily similar in that they both promote unrealistic body ideals that feed off people's insecurities and vulnerabilities. And in the past few years, you may have noticed, as I have, that there's been a huge deluge of fitness personalities who use Instagram to build enormous followings and market, you know, their own exercise guides or meal plans, apps, books, clothing, that kind of thing. And heartfelt captions and, you know, motivational quotes are often used to deliver um, these kind of sometimes misguided messages of body positivity and self-love alongside pictures of washboard abs and, you know, their sales pictures. And of course, it's not just an emphasis on physical fitness that's the problem. Within gym culture, views on food can be very disordered. Um, And I've experienced this um, when attending gyms as as a gym member myself. Food shaming and pictures for keto diets, clean eating and intermittent fasting are a regular part of the gym floor conversation. Carb-free diets, fasted cardio and cutting weight are often held as badges of honour and form fertile ground for the development of disordered eating and body dysmorphia. So I hope that sets the scene for this episode in which I speak with Monique Jeffcoat all about these issues within gym and fitness culture. Monique is a non-diet dietitian, sports dietitian and personal trainer with a lived experience of disordered eating from her days as a bodybuilder. This conversation is so packed full of stuff that I've been bursting to chat to a qualified someone about and Monique definitely fit that bill. Some of the things we talk about are how and why Monique opened her private practice soon after graduating the fact that haze just makes so much sense. <laughs> um, and Monique, you know, she says every single body deserves dignity and respect. Monique's lived experience of disordered eating recovery from her days as a competitive bodybuilder, including the more fun, lighthearted Beyonce themed side of things. How Monique never disliked her body as much as she did when she was closest to society's ideal body shape. The contrast in body diversity and body acceptance between the bodybuilding 
versus powerlifting scenes. The many ways diet culture manifests in the gym setting, we honestly could have just spent the whole episode talking about that. On being a non-diet dietitian in a gym and dealing respectfully with weight-centric fitness professionals, the importance of informed consent, body autonomy and compassion regardless of whether our clients take a weight-centric or weight-neutral approach. We talk about low energy availability or red S in um, relative energy deficiency in sport and hypothalamic amenorrhea in female athletes, which both of us have experienced. And the problem with dismissing menstrual disturbances as just what happens to active women. And finally, we talk about Monique's experiences with Vipassana meditation and where this practice fits in with her work as a non-diet dietitian and fitness professional. So as you will soon see, Monique is such a vibrant, passionate and warm person and you, you'll you notice her enthusiasm for intuitive eating and weight neutral approaches. It's just obvious from the moment she starts speaking Monique is hilarious and just speaking with her makes you want to jump up and just kind of dive in wholeheartedly to the non-diet space if you aren't there already. (laughs) So a quick bio, Monique is a weight inclusive, health at every size aligned, accredited practicing dietitian, sports dietitian and soon to be intuitive eating counsellor and a certified personal trainer. She is also studying a Bachelor of Psychological Science. This girl is, you know, all about continual professional development and I just love that. Um, The doors to the Intuitive Dietitian Clinic opened in November 2019 to help clients improve their relationship with food and their bodies so that they can show up for what matters most in their life. When Monique is not teaching intuitive eating at her clinic, she's working at F45 Corumban as the head trainer for the kids program, hanging out with her dog, cooking, eating, riding, playing piano. She's at the ocean, spending time with family and friends, collecting crystals, meditating, or listening to Beyonce. For Patreon subscribers to the podcast, there are three offerings accompanying this episode. Monique has very kindly offered an intuitive eating PDF resource, um, also a discount off an an initial consultation with her, a 25% discount off that that is claimable until the 24th of July 2020. And the third bonus that I'm offering to Patreon subscribers is a bonus audio on Red S and hypothalamic amenorrhea from myself. Um, And in that audio, I talk about what a normal period looks like, the lowdown on Red S and HA, my personal experiences with both of these, which um, which were brought on due to overexercise and under eating and what to do about them. So you can access those Patreon bonuses quite easily um, by going to the link in the show notes or going to www.patreon.com slash nondietyogi and you can access all of those bonuses at the lowest tier of $2 US per month and along with that you can access a bunch of other resources, audios, meditations, offers, discounts and all kinds of um, yummy things provided by um, my beautiful past guests. I'd like to announce the winner of the infused mugwort herbal body oil that I have been running as a giveaway on my Patreon account and the winner is Rebecca Jane. So congratulations, Rebecca. You have a bottle of my handmade herbal mugwort body oil being sent your way. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Honestly, it was just jam packed. I could have spoken to Monique for triple the length of time. Um, There's so much in this that I think is really important for people to to hear about. And so without further ado, here is my interview with Monique Jeffcoat. Hello, Monique, and welcome to the Non-Diet Yogi podcast. It's so awesome to have you here. I'm super excited to be chatting with you. (laughs) I got it right that time. (laughs) Oh, 
Oh dear. Yeah, I just um, stumbled across my words the first time I tried to greet Monique because I'm so excited <laughs> to have her here. Um, We've just spoken for about 20 minutes already, so we're all warmed up. <laughs> we are warm. Um, so Monique, just to set the scene for the listeners, mm -hmm. um, we first met not that long ago, actually. Um, yeah, a year ago. It, yeah, just it was what, a year ago. Yeah. And and at that time, you were a fairly new graduate. You were yeah. diving into the world of health at every size, although I think you were already kind of in it. Yeah, <laughs> which yeah. Is so wonderful. And you've since opened up your own brick and mortar private practice. Yeah. A dietitian in Twin yeah. Kids, which is just so <laughs> fucking great. I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I was thinking I wouldn't swear too much, but I am excited. So I just think it's so brave and um thank you forward thinking of you to to do that yeah. yeah um yeah well when we met I was working somewhere else um as a dietitian and um I suppose adding on to a bit of a backstory um I've got great things to say about the place that I was working at um I was a sole dietitian so it felt like I was sort of off on my own anyway um and naturally found myself pulled towards health at every size and non-diet intuitive eating. And that's what I spent, uh, you know, I, I'm, I've graduated about two years ago and I've pretty just well spent every single second since invested in these, these sort of frameworks because I'm pulled towards them. Um, and at that time, yeah, I was definitely, I was practicing as a dietitian for the first time and realizing what dietitian I, I wanted to be and what kind of dietitian I didn't want to be. And specifically when I was there working for another company, I think I came to a point where, um, one, I have to give credit, I've had an amazing business mentor who has helped me break through so many different things in order to get the clinic up and running for sure. Um, and at that time, I think I realized that I wouldn't be working from my greatest power unless I was working in a space where I felt um, free to practice in a way that felt aligned with me. Um, and that meant, you know, really moving into that, that at times if I was met with clients um, where I knew it would be best say um, at that point to refer out, if it wasn't going to align with the way that I worked, then that would be a point where I would refer out. And there was something in me that didn't, feel comfortable doing that while I was working for someone else too. Um, so that was then also a big leap into the intuitive dietitian clinic. Um, and yeah, just that, that feeling of knowing that until I was working for myself, I wouldn't be working from my greatest power. Um, so yeah, I, I've worked with it and I still work with him. Um, I'm so grateful um, through all things business because I'm not, naturally a business savvy person but I yeah I opened the doors to the intuitive dietitian clinic in September last year so it's quite fresh um and it's going quite well and yeah it's completely centered around intuitive eating um and the non-diet approach and health at every size so I absolutely love it basically so I'm glad you do <laughs> <laughs> oh how wonderful just yeah. yeah it's so interesting just to hear about how you know you were working um under another business and how you felt like you know that was that was okay but you couldn't really step into the full mm. power mode of what you really wanted to do unless you were doing it within your own space and I hear you I hear you on that yeah 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 um okay so you've already kind of answered my first question about <laughs> what what led you to walk down the non-diet path so early in your career yeah. as a dietitian it actually sounds like you were into health at every size and weight neutral approaches before you even graduated is that right um somewhat um because where I remember I distinctly remember the moment when I first learned about the non-diet approach and it was in our third year of the nutrition and dietetics degree and it was a lecture by Fiona Willer mm -hmm. um, and it was sort of like this concept that we just had not heard of up until that point um, and I remember leaving that lecture and walking out and thinking holy shit this is why I became a dietitian and I've just not lost sight of that since mm -hmm. um, and of course that was um, a very brief introduction to what that all meant 
as well, but I just knew um, that it made a lot of sense, basically. Um, and so, yeah, I had an awareness of that sort of around that would have been third year and then obviously moved into placement and that sort of thing, which is clinical in the hospital. So it's different. Um, and yeah, just sort of ever since I graduated, I just naturally felt gravitated towards doing personal development in those areas um, and just sort of hooked right into it. I was like, well, it's no time to waste. I know, I know what, I just knew what kind of practitioner that I wanted to be and personally that aligned very much so with it. And I appreciate, I have an appreciation of research and I appreciated the research that was around it too. And from just that compassionate approach of, um, you know, specifically with health at every size that every single body deserves dignity and respect and doesn't deserve scrutiny or discrimination or, or whatever those things might be, which tend to crop up in, in healthcare um, and within healthcare professionals, it just, I don't even know any other way to describe it than it just made sense. There there's just wasn't another option for me, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I suppose it, um, it just happened. Um, yeah. From, from when I finished and how I was practicing also in my first job. And now obviously it's just a lot more solidified and, um, cemented from all of that yeah oh I love it I love that and I love whenever I hear <laughs> Hayes acting as a resurrector of passion <laughs> for dietetics like I hear that a lot in the little non-diet yeah. Hayes world that I guess we both somewhat yeah. live in and because that's what happened to me as well I was I don't know a year or two into my career as a dietitian just handling yeah. weight loss plans and it was just yeah so mind-numbingly boring Mm, Um, yeah boring just so boring and I was seriously considering like this is not what I want to do I've already changed careers once to like be a dietitian (laughs) and now I'm stuck again but yeah then then along comes these you know come these paradigms and health at every Mm. size and the penny drops and you're just like oh my god yes this is the kind of dietitian I want to be you know yeah Um, yeah someone that actually values and respects people and bodies yeah yeah um, absolutely basically so yeah and I think the last um I I've been lucky um in the sense of learning more about health at every size um I'm definitely still learning but it's been helpful I've I've got a mentor who um is obviously centered in health at every size and on the Hayes committee and that has just been a world of learning for me um, being able to learn from her as well on that. And so I suppose the journey for me personally from being a new grad and entering this space is that at times it's felt um, like just complete outsourcing of so much information because it's, um, it's learning so differently to, I suppose, the way that we were or what we were exposed to in uni that it's kind of felt like, um, I suppose a bit challenging in that aspect, um, worth it obviously, but, um, challenging in reaching out to a lot of people and reaching out to a lot of the different education that's out there to further myself in these frameworks and paradigms so that I can be aware and well equipped with it basically. And I'm obviously still definitely, definitely learning on my journey as well. Oh, yes, we are all still learning. Yeah. So I, I don't think, I hope that never ends. Yeah, um, I don't think so. <laughs> and <laughs> the mentorship thing, yeah, that's mm. so crucial, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's just, yeah. It makes a big difference, a big, big difference. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Monique, I'm just wondering if you, so you've taken us back to kind of that turning point when (laughs) Fiona Willey came (laughs) to lecture at uni and the the light kind of switched on, but I'm wondering if you could fill us in a bit more about your backstory Mm. Um, on social media, you know, you've shared your own experiences, your personal experiences, um, and I'm wondering if you could, if you're comfortable sharing that with us and how that maybe also led you to finding these paradigms. Yeah, and I think that it 
absolutely played a very integral role in in the space that I'm in as a practitioner today. Um, absolutely, and I do feel comfortable talking about it. Um, but I so. Um, on top of being a dietitian, I'm a personal trainer and that's the career that I've had for a lot longer than I've had as a dietitian. So I've been a PT since I was about 19 years old. So that's about seven years. Um, and I've been in that career for that time. And, um, when I first sort of entered the gym scene, so I suppose more of a backstory, I didn't really grow up, um, as a very active individual. Um, most personal trainers have a, have a story where they're like these sporty kids. No, um, wasn't me at all. But when I finished high school, I sort of, um, started going to the gym, um, and sort of fell into a bit of a bodybuilding scene. Um, so quite different, uh, experiences and, um, I, I sort of fell into that scene and I actually competed in a bodybuilding competition so that involved a prep, um, which was quite strict, definitely. Um, so it was not a whole heap of food. Um, mind you, I didn't have nutrition knowledge at this time either, and I outsourced a coach. But I um, wasn't having much food at all. I was training really, really vigorously. It would be for a few hours a day with you know, waking up in the morning, fasted cardio with my apple cider <laughs> and um, sprints at night with some sort of training thing in between. And um, it just sort of became my life really. Um, and a lot of other things really sort of fell down. Uh, it's really all I could, uh, you know, I, I like to open up this discussion in that I'm aware that everybody's experience is really, really different. And what I'm highlighting is my experience. Um, and for me, it got, it got to that end where you enter into body and dieting and it turns into something else. That was my history where, um, I just became obsessed with my body and with food. And that wasn't something that I'd ever been on my radar prior to entering this prep phase. Um, and you know, knowing the physiology physiology and biology of our bodies, we know that we get obsessed with food when we're under eating. And we know that in that space of where everything is about the way that you look, you get on a bodybuilding stage and you get assessed and you get ranked because of how you look. When you're in that space, of course, you're going to be self-critical in abundance of your body. You know, we know that now. Um, and, you know, for me, it was that I withdrew from a lot of social events because if it involved food, I didn't want to be there. Um, you know, um, it affected relationships in my life. I actually, the year that I did my bodybuilding competition was my first year of studying nutrition and dietetics. Now, mind you, for anyone that knows that though, it starts off with a lot of background subjects like um, anatomy, physiology, chemistry. And, um, you know, I actually failed university subjects in my first year because this goal was the only thing that I saw. Um, and I spent my days just thinking of it. Um, so yeah, anyway, I went through that process and, and I do have to highlight some, um, of the positives in that, um, I found parts of it fun in terms of walking on a stage. I feel like I have a sussy closeted side that got released a little bit. <laughs> And um, there was a theme where around, and I was Beyonce, so I'm obsessed with Beyonce, and I dressed up as Beyonce and did her Beyonce dance. You know, that was my theme where around. Um, so there's definitely those parts, you know, and um, all of that sort of thing as well. There's good and bad parts to everything, right? But um, but the biggest thing was that there was something flying under the radar there that that nobody around me, and that's fine, had the had the awareness that there was something not quite right going on with the behaviors that I was partaking in. Um, and I've got total compassion for myself back then too, and total compassion for um, people around me. And we really don't know what we don't know. And that's why, that's why we're here. That's why I'm here to, to respectfully bring awareness to the fact that shit, man, that's not actually healthy at all. And that's not a nice mental place to live in. I mean, I, I'd never disliked my body so much and it had been what you would call, um, you know, closer to 
say diet culture's ideal body shape than it had ever been and I'd you know it was just like a war and and for me what I learned the most was coming out of that so I came out of that and I experienced weight gain which you know we know <laughs> that so heavily cemented <laughs> in our research is that dieting is the strongest predictor of weight gain regardless of the original body weight of the dieter and I experienced that um, and experienced secretive eating after that too you know I this is maybe too much information but you know I'd um, you know, drive home from uni and I'd stop into Hungry Jack's and I'd eat in the car alone on my own as if I was doing something so terrible. And I'm like, that's not something that I had ever done prior mm -hmm. to, to this experience of diving into that. Um, so those experiences have absolutely shaped without a single doubt the the messaging that I have around food and body and um, just that awareness of bringing light to some of those things because I, at that time, I didn't have anyone um, that knew that that was any different. You know, it was normalized and it was celebrated. Um, and so I, that absolutely plays such a significant role in the practitioner that I am today in that um, you know, maybe if I'd had a had a little Monique back then to go, hey, how are you how are you actually feeling? Mm. Like how how are you feeling? Like what 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 do you feel on a daily basis or anything like that to just open up that discussion? But I'm I'm uh, so grateful for my experiences. I'm definitely big on that. Even the even the most difficult and challenging experiences tend to teach us the most, and I'm so grateful for it. Um, but yeah, so that's a bit of my background, I suppose, for how it all started for me in the sort of health and fitness industry. Um, and yeah, sort of, um, I suppose, along that journey, that's definitely changed, obviously, so much in terms of um, movement and what that means for me now too, and food, mm -hmm. of course. Oh, of course. It, it, mm. it, yeah, it's obviously really shaped your, mm. your not only your career, but your personal um, journey and your values that you hold mm. now. And I mean, it's just going back to what you, you know, bodybuilding, like talk about <laughs> diving in the head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like full on sport in which, you know, eating, body mm. weight, body shape, those concerns seem to be very prevalent. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, and as you said, that just that, such an highly uh, like massive focus on oh uh, yeah percent focus on yeah um, appearance you know the tans the makeup the glittery bikinis and yeah. it you know it kind of looks glamorous from the outside but behind mm. the scenes mm. um from what i've you know listening to people like you or yeah. clients who've, who've been through us down a similar path yeah it's actually quite brutal I mean the training and the dieting the cutting the constant preoccupation mm. and the disappointment if you, you you know you put in all that work and you don't mm. place afterwards and of course there's the aftermath that you touched on with the the backlash binging which is of course a very yeah. natural and normal and to be expected response to yeah it was biological totally biological yeah. but as you said if you don't know that, that I didn't know that at the you time. Don't know what you don't know, and yeah, so, um, yeah, I've yeah. met very few female bodybuilders who have been untouched by disordered eating and body dysmorphia. I mean, yeah, how could you not be affected when your life is dominated by numbers, scale? Yeah, what? Yeah, the numbers on the scale, calories in and out, training hours, um, and that irony that you talked about of being closer than ever to yes. social ideal of the female body and yet feeling so highly dissatisfied with the body. Yeah. So extremely, wow. so extremely. Wow. Um, yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, I suppose, you know, I, I, I reflect on my experience there and I'm grateful for my journey. I really do believe that one studying my degree in nutrition and dietetics and more prominently an awareness of these sorts of frameworks and paradigms that we refer to um, as well as therapy of course I, I did go in in my own um, my own journey of healing um, years ago 
healed my distorted relationship with food and body. And um, I have to say that the learnings and the education that I've had along the way have really, really helped that. And I wonder, you know, where, where my, my relationship with my body and food and mind be if, if not for um, stepping down a path of, of this way. And, and that's how I know I'm always on the right track, you know? Um, but um, yeah, you can definitely think about, wow, I wonder where that, I wonder where that might be right now, mm. if not. So it just, allows you to provide that gratitude i suppose deep gratitude i mean you still might be in waking up for fasted cardio and apple cider <laughs> vinegar which oh my god horrific. <laughs> i know i know casey it, it was it was another world it was a different it was a totally different world mm-hmm. to obviously to the world um that i am that i'm in today and and like i said it was very it was very normalized and um you know that's that's what it was there wasn't anything else that was that I that was available kind of thing or different support um other than what I obviously got after Mm. Mm. so Monique um (laughs) could you tell us a little bit about your background as a fitness professional you've touched Mm. on it but maybe how and how that kind of possibly led you to becoming an accredited sports dietitian not just yeah yeah for sure um, so yeah, I've got my, my fitness background, which is, is, lo- you know, my longest career so far. Um, and, um, along the way, you know, I've dabbled in different sports, obviously one of those being bodybuilding. And then, and then sort of after that, I took a big break from movement personally and moved into powerlifting. And that's, um, where I, it was, it was a big contrast for me the two um and i'm aware that diet culture can can seep into all sports absolutely um my experience personally with the contrast of powerlifting was totally different to that of bodybuilding in that um i had a really great friend where i moved into this space with and um i got a deep appreciation in a really positive way of what um how food helped me to perform in that chosen uh, sport of powerlifting. You know, if I'm going to go lift a 100 kilo barbell off the floor kind of thing, um, you know, food's going to help me do that kind of thing. Um, And so, you know, there was this focus of, say, bodybuilding where it was not at all about that because I was under eating and, you know, I I lost my period in that phase too, which is a big sign of an energy deficit. Um, versus the other side of that where hey actually we need food and we need lots of it to to go in um to go and do what you want to do and go and lift some heavy stuff um and just loved totally loved the contrast and really started to build an appreciation for my body um and that's probably where I um what moved me towards studying sports dietetics, um, being in that field um, of powerlifting and experiencing that. Um, and I just wanted to, I'm definitely someone that just wants to know more. I just want to know more. And I always knew that I wanted to study sports dietetics too, but um, my experiences in that and then in just sort of, I suppose the PT fitness world really led me to studying that sports um, nutrition course last year too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Just fueling our bodies, just fueling our bodies enough. <laughs> like, yeah. it seems so simple, but yeah. for some reason it gets complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Amidst all the diet culture and weight stigma and fat phobia. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, God. There was, yeah, that's so interesting. I really am loving hearing about your experiences of that contrast between the bodybuilding world and the powerlifting world. Um, mm. Yeah, I felt that. I felt that contrast. I'm aware that, um, you know, like I sort of touched on before, that maybe other people's experiences in that setting might be different too, you know. I'm not just touching on mine and and as a professional as well. But, um, you know, even in that, that setting of powerlifting, um, it was it was just different in terms of the diversity of bodies that you saw, um, you know, walking into, walking into a powerlifting gym, you know. Um, total diversity compared to this, this one one body shape or type goal which was the other side of it um 
yeah, so that was just really refreshing. Like it felt um, really, really refreshing, basically. Oh, I bet it must have. I mean, mm. I don't, I don't have personal experience with the bodybuilding scene, but definitely with the powerlifting scene. Mm. Um, and yeah, I agree. I really appreciate just that mm. body diversity. And I mean, when you are competing, there's there's that Wilkes score, the Wilkes coefficient, which yeah, um, yeah, allows people of all different body sizes and weights to to kind of compete against each other which I think yeah is fantastic it is it is a sport that in that way embraces yeah. body diversity um, yeah and I can only imagine if you're coming from bodybuilding to powerlifting just how stark that contrast <laughs> must have been yeah 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 um oh. complete it felt like a, a 360 but in the best way possible totally totally and that said I must say, I maybe it's because I didn't have that stark contrast of <laughs> bodybuilding, and yeah, I was already just like very had very much had my <laughs> health at every size goggles on. But mm. in this the gym where I was training for powerlifting, mm. I still did notice yeah uh, some disordered eating, and I it's guess, absolutely there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's common, you know. I'm guessing to any strength or to any sport, of course. Mm. But, you know, Mm. I saw things like people um, trying to get down to their um, weight class too early. You know, they might start that process so early that their strength progress would actually stop and then they couldn't even Mm. perform. They couldn't even compete. And I've I've seen coaches do that, you know. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Or even not so much weight-centric stuff, but just in terms of diet, you know, living off stimulants like coffee because they're not eating enough. What you said about eating enough is so important. And I felt like um, maybe it was, you know, beginner's gains. But when I started, (laughs) I just felt really strong and that I I could really make good progress because I was just eating like a typo. And because I, by that stage, I'd been through all my disordered stuff years before that. And I understood like, if you don't eat, you can oh, yeah. train. You just cannot yeah. train without compromising your body or yeah. your being or both in some way. So yeah, thank you so much for touching on that. I just yeah, yeah. It's, no, okay. you're welcome. And you're right. Um, you know, I think that I think that everywhere that we go, um, you know, inside outside of sport, there's um that the underlying sometimes um disordered eating or comments or just small little things that when you when you have that lens on and your eyes are kind of I suppose I refer to it as open um it's so prominent it's really prominent and you just pick up the little nuances or just the, a little phrase in a word and um you know absolutely it's there Oh my God. Can we talk about that? Because yeah. that's, that's huge for me. I mean, you work in a gym. I've spent yeah. a fair bit of time in the gym world, you know, both as a yoga teacher and just a regular punter going to train and strength and conditioning kind of gym. Um, yeah. And from what I've seen, and I'm pretty sure from what you've seen, diet culture is it's pretty mm. rampant in some of these gyms. Um, in the gyms where I've attended, you know, there's, there's just constant four, eight or 12 week challenges and they're usually... Yeah quite centered or completely centered around weight loss um or fat loss yeah as they like to say um you know <laughs> as if they're different <laughs> or, or just things like this pushing of really questionable supplements mm. or diet yeah. food products um yeah. protein ice cream was a really big thing in mm. one of these ginger chains it's like you know Maybe eating normal ice cream could also be nice and, yeah. um, and tastier. Yeah. Um, it's just weird stuff like that. Or, you know, as you've mentioned, the disordered eating or the under eating, which is just the norm. And in some cases, kind of actively promoted by the head coaches who themselves are so en- yeah. embedded in diet culture. And then, of course, there's all these different diets. You know, I know keto and paleo are really popular in gym culture right now. Yeah. Um, have your experiences been similar as a personal, you know, as a fitness instructor, fitness professional? And what is it like being a non-diet dietitian? <laughs> kind of okay, there is so much <laughs> to unpack there. So, yeah. so much. Um, um, okay, so, um, yeah, I would say that out of everywhere 
or uh, to know how to frame this, but um, I've never seen diet culture more manifested anywhere than in a gym setting um, and within that sort of fitness health uh, um, setting. Absolutely. Um, and again, drawing on my experiences and, and what I think or why I think that that might be is because I really don't think that there is any education. And in terms of my formal training as becoming a personal trainer, um, no awareness brought to disordered eating and any of those sorts of things, you know, um, and if a PT undergoes nutrition training, you know, within a PT cert, it's a very bare minimal, you know, few weeks to a month sort of certificate. And that's what I did before I did nutrition dietetics. So not at all, not at all credible for the, for the extensive four years that goes on with a degree. But um, I just feel like there is so much uh, almost that support lacking toward PTs too. You know, I come from this perspective of um, we don't, we really don't know what we don't know. Um, and I think that one, I've definitely been through phases of feeling frustrated in settings, but two, moving into more of a space of, hey, that's why my voice is here, um, to bring respectfully awareness to some of these things that, hey, this language that is um, just a brief little comment like, um, oh, you know, I ate cake last night. So, you know, I'm here, I've got to burn it off or um, my workout didn't count if I don't reach X, Y, Z on, on my point score on the board or, um, uh, you know, had a massive weekend. I've got to get back into it. Like just these really little comments that to anyone else, you're like, oh yeah, totally. Like, let's get back into it. Oh, you better burn off that cake, uh, you know, or any of those sorts of things. But when that, this is those moments where when your eyes are open, you're like, oh my God, that's, are flying totally under the radar and you, you know, yeah, maybe you're saying that but you have no idea how that can be interpreted by someone else too, how that can be absorbed um, as pressure and negativity and stress. And, um, you know, most interestingly, a lot of the time, sometimes this talk can come from personal trainers. Mm -hmm. So of course, people within a gym setting that go, you know, they're people that you look up to, that's going to be mirrored that talk and that language is going to be mirrored. Um, so I kind of think there's something at that, that hierarchy level that, um, you know, that's where we start almost because um, I do think definitely there's, there's situations where there is awareness to what's going on and there's that taking advantage of vulnerable populations for, you know, monetary gains or whatever that that might be. Definitely I'm aware that that goes on. Um, I'm also aware that there are populations of people that really just don't actually know anything different. Um, and that comes from professionals in the fitness industry too. Um, I, you know, and I speak from that from my education, becoming a personal trainer too. These weren't things that were discussed. You know, there isn't as a PT um, uh, things in place like we have as dietitians continued professional development where we actually have to keep going and keep learning to uphold our accreditation of being a dietitian. They're not things that quite exist. Um, so I like to come in from that sort of compassionate approach of that one, you don't know any better, but two, let's bring some awareness to that. Let's, let's educate and let's, let's get some awareness there. And I think for me personally, you know, you asked, what's it like being a non-dietitian in a gym? Um, at times, that's been frustration and um, I suppose an unaware, not an unawareness, but um, moving through how to project a voice mm. respectfully in a space that feels like you're the only voice. Um, and two, moving into that, which is definitely what I feel like and um, we sort of touched on this before we started recording, I kind of feel like that's a space that I'm moving into, you know, I'm really realizing that um, 
this is a really great opportunity for people to actually just learn something that they don't really know. And I will wholeheartedly admit, openly admit that one of my biggest defaults is assuming that people know what I know. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I'm like, oh, everyone knows, you know, non-diet. Like everybody knows that feeling guilty about food is really counterproductive. Everybody knows that stressing about food, actually, hey, that's not quite good for our health. Everybody knows that we're not meant to feel guilty or that food's morally equal or that, um, this language is actually sneaky diet culture. Like everyone totally knows that. No, Monique, no, they, they don't. No, I'm, I'm and, the same trap. <laughs> and, and that's, um, you know, again, I can wholeheartedly admit that that's my default. And um, I'm, I'm definitely, yeah, in, I suppose in that space where, no, actually, hey, like that can be a voice where people are brought attention to something that um, they didn't previously know. And, and, just getting people to reflect on their relationship with food and their body. You know, I've, I've started to do some, um, I've started to do some talks um, within my, um, where I work at the gym. Um, and I've started to do some of talks, which are all about our relationship to food and our body. So whenever I do like a, I suppose a talk or a presentation, I always bring it back to my core mission of the mm-hmm. intuitive dietitian clinic, which is the enjoyment of knowing that you've walked away better, more free, more present, more connected to food, movement, and your body from being in my caring presence. And so whenever I've got a, a talk or anything that I need to do, I always bring it back to that. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to make sure that you've walked away better, more free, more present, more connected to food, blah, 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 blah. That's my goal. So a lot of what those talks have looked like, and really they've only happened over the last week and over next week is really getting people to reflect on their relationship with food and their body, talking about things like weight stigma, because a lot of the time people don't realize they are engaging in weight stigma either. It's one of those situations where um, it's an opportunity of, um, you know, hey, you know, do you know that that's what's going on or um, bringing light to that? Um, and you know, so speaking about that and about health at every size and, um, you know, talking a lot about dieting, um, you know, and you know, what often dieting looks like it's met with, you know, complete ignorance of hunger cues or unnecessary restriction. Um, you know, if there's no, um, uh, you know, allergy or, or whatnot present and this sort of demonization of certain foods and food groups deemed bad or not allowed or bad for my health or going to do X, Y, and Z to my weight. And, you know, like putting that all out there and going, so with that in mind, if that's a lot of what dieting generally tends to look like, you know, do we actually think that they are healthy behaviors to engage in? And more often than not, we're like, no, of course it's not healthy to um, demonize food and be stressing so much about it and feeling so guilty and, and running and going off and doing double sessions because we feel so guilty because we've just eaten or really restricting food groups for no real reason. Um, And you know, exercising to just burn off calories or, or eating below our required energy levels, just eating below our needs. Like that's not a healthy thing. (laughs) Um, And so those conversations have been really great because they've been with the people that I spend a lot of time with, within my work as a PT. Um, And it's been really nice to sort of have that met with, oh, wow, that was really insightful. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I can walk away thinking about, you know, if one person just walks away from that, thinking about the next time that they're feeling a certain way and going, oh, oh, I can remember that. I remember that, what Monique said or anything like that. And then, then I've, um, you know, I've been able to help someone. So that's really exciting that I'm um, in that space of doing a few things like that. And I am definitely quite lucky with the team that I do work with as a PT. Um we do, there's sort of various people within the team who have a background in mental health and support work and counseling. So opening up and having these conversations with them is really beautiful in that they're quite receptive to it. You know, they're really receptive to it. um, I should say. And I think in the past um, I haven't opened up those conversations, but that's what I mean about the space that I'm sort of in now Mm -hmm. is very much so about, 
just that open dialogue and communication and hey this is this is my expertise and what what we can really really bring to people's lives to help enrich their experience with their food and their body and eating and all that sort of thing and just something just something different that's often you know time and time again which obviously I feel like a lot of people working in this space here you know it's just refreshing to hear something that's um that's different and, and maybe my bias but actually helpful <laughs> I'm with you a hundred percent there yeah. oh my gosh Monique first of all can I just say well done like congratulations yeah. and thank you so much for for doing those talks thank and for you. having those conversations because they're so so much needed and mm. as you've discovered actually quite well received and it sounds yeah. like you're working in a very supportive um, environment mm. given you've got other colleagues um, who work in the gym who are also mental health um, mm. professionals or qualified in some way. That is just, that's just fertile ground, isn't it, for, yeah. for getting um, these healthy, health-based messages out there, not weight-based stuff. Yeah. Um, and I just, it just reminded me of this little story because yeah. I have a question on that. Um, and I think, you know, something else that you said was people are really receptive or vulnerable, however you want to see it, mm. to advice from coaches, from the fitness trainers, and maybe even from successful athletes, older successful mm. athletes maybe. Um, my, my powerlifting coach, Graham McDonald, who I used to work with, he, he was an elite athlete and he now coaches, he coaches people who are competing in the olympic games like he coaches elite wow as well as like totally like normal <laughs> regular people like myself and <laughs> i i mean i just respect give yourself credit casey <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, i'm i'm definitely not not an athlete in that <laughs> But um, I did enjoy I did enjoy training with him, and yeah, and I respected him so much. You know, I would just do anything that he said yeah. in terms of training. I trusted him so much. He mm. was so experienced, and luckily for me, he was really pragmatic and open minded, and he he mm. never pushed nutrition crap onto me. You know, mm. he I think he knew better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he yeah. was a non diet dietitian, and he was a real sweetheart. And he even often asked me advice, um, yeah. you know, regarding some of his clients, often women who are under eating. Yeah. And he was really aware of, you know, those issues surrounding female athletes with tendency to under eat and fad dieting. Yeah. Um, and he had even disclosed his own past issues with his own body image mm. stuff. So, mm. and he'd posted publicly about this. So I think he'll be okay with me mentioning that. But yeah. I I got lucky. I feel like I know mm, not all yeah. coaches are like that, um, yeah. and I have even had run-ins with really fat phobic mm. coaches and gym oh, managers yeah. who just I mean I can be going you know pitching health at every size and giving them um, you know all the evidence-based amazing research that's done, and it doesn't matter how mm. much I offer. Mm, they were so deep rooted yeah yeah and I'm just wondering like mm. have you ever encountered that like how how mm. do you work with fitness professionals who who mm. don't or just don't want to get health at every size but yeah there are many reasons you know that, that they might be doing that yeah for sure um for sure and I totally hear what you're saying it um you know when you come up to heads with with that sort of you know, I suppose resistance, you realize how, how deep rooted some of that fat phobia can really, really be. And it's hard. Um, and I think that my, my experience, um, you know, I suppose I'll, I'll be honest, it's, um, it feels like it's just beginning in terms of, you know, voicing the, um, you know, the messages of weight stigma and health at every size in that setting. It, it really, really is. Um, personally, I suppose within, within my team, I haven't quite experienced that, but I'm talking about the team that I work with mm -hmm. um, previously. Absolutely. As in within my experiences um, as a gym goer, um, and yeah, more particularly, I suppose in the, in that bodybuilding scene as well. Um, but I, I absolutely will say that, you know, 
I think that the next year uh, or next few months and weeks of my life will definitely have me opened up to a lot of experiences to do with that as, um, yeah, I move into that space of feeling comfortable with having that voice um, to make some challenges um, and challenge perspectives and, uh, and deal with that. So yeah, I'll just be honest, that's my, that's my experience thus far, but um, also aware that those experiences for sure will come as we step into, um, into that space more ourselves oh. and having that voice. Yeah. Oh, you're so, you're so inspiring me right now. You're just so full power. <laughs> You're so full power. And I think that your energy and your passion, um, it's, it, it almost seems like it actually opens up that space for you to, mm-hmm. to come in and um, offer a new viewpoint to receptive people because yeah. that's the way that you do it. So I'm so in awe and so inspired by you. And I think, I think, notes. I think that's what, um, you know, I suppose I've sort of learnt a lot that, or I, I suppose bring it back to what did I need at that time? And, um, I suppose with the way that I communicate some of those messages is, is that I feel if someone came in really hard and fast to me when I was Monique a few years ago, not knowing much else, I would have put walls up. Mm-hmm. I would be like, oh man, like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, <laughs> and, and I, I really very often check in with myself because I can absolutely go hard and fast. <laughs> I can absolutely, it's more my partner that sees that though. So he's fine. <laughs> um, and you know, so I'll be like, okay, just cool down a little bit here, Monique, because, because people are receptive to somebody that, you know, can, you've got to be respectful. You've got, like, remember that people are at where they're at. And I really like, so I, um, oh, on top of what I'm doing, I, I just recently started a degree in psychology and this, what I'm about to say reminded me of the bit of the conversation that we're having, um, I suppose. And one of the assignments that I'm doing, um, is sort of like a comparison of papers. Um, and it's, I won't get too into it, but it's about, the need for informed consent when, when undertaking a therapy like recovered memory therapy, um, so repressed memories from childhood or all that sort of thing, and, and this big need for informed consent um, because there can be consequences of recovering false memories, false repressed memories, for example. Um, and, you know, this paper was all about, um, you know, the need for informed consent of, one, providing the benefits of proposed treatments um, two, offering alternatives and three, providing the risks of treatment. And I was like, yeah, like this. And, and that's how I like to practice, I suppose, personally within my own clinic when it comes to weight loss and intuitive eating and non-diet is, um, you know, allowing the client to, to get that education because they're not going to get it somewhere else. They're not going to go jump online and, and review the literature maybe. <laughs> um, and providing that to them, you know, what are the, the potential benefits of this? What are else some alternative treatments? What are the potential risks? And I think that it's just one important to do that. You know, even if there's a skepticism of literature, one that, people are made aware of the literature that's informed consent first and foremost in my in my opinion um and I suppose what I'm really getting at with that was that it's just always in a really uh respectful yet informative way like this is this is what it is you know this is what we know but I am big that people have body autonomy at the end of all of that too you know you can go through all of that and say you know these are the risks associated with intentional weight loss endeavors blah 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 blah. these are some alternatives and these are you know um some benefits of x y and z and I really do believe that at the end of the day, people have body autonomy. So you can present that information to somebody and they can choose what to do with their body because that's what it is with, um, you know, we all have free will. We can all choose what, what we want to do. But I sort of feel like as long as I'm um, providing that information to people that they're not likely maybe not going to get from somewhere else and it's in that just compassionate way that's not judgmental and I don't know, just all of those sorts of things, then then that's what it's all about. I kind of forget where I was going with that, but there you go. I think you've made some really amazing golden points. I mean, just the, 
just the concept of being respectful and informative mm. and evidence based. I mean, if you just stick with that, I don't think you can go too wrong. And mm. and the thing about body autonomy is that yes, it is up to the individual, and if mm. they choose to take a weight centric approach then that is absolutely their right and their mm. choice to do so yeah no judgment and who are we to say like oh well no you shouldn't or you, you know anything yeah. like that um yeah I really really yeah. appreciate that approach thanks Monique that's okay, <laughs> okay. all right so changing gears away mm-hmm. from not 100% away from the gym thing but a little bit away from gyms and more towards um female specific Mm. health and um, struggles that female not just athletes but any active women have Mm. um, being active and also swimming around in diet culture as we all are yeah Um, and I'm just thinking a little while back in the conversation you mentioned that when you were having your own experiences with mm. um, disordered eating, when you were immersed in that bodybuilding world, that you mm. lost your period for a while. And yeah. I've found that um, this is a really, really common experience mm. with women who are <clears throat> either overtraining or under eating or both. Mm. And even if it's not a total loss of period, it might be period starting to get wacky and do weird things, you know, mm. oligomenorrhea where the cycles start to get further and further apart yeah you know more than 35 days apart or something like that um and I've I've also experienced hypothalamic Mm. amenorrhea which was induced by disordered Mm. eating under eating and overtraining in triathlon was my torture Ah. of choice um (laughs) yeah yeah and um I'm just wondering if you would be open to chatting about that a little yeah yeah for sure um you know and that's all um referring to the red s you know the relative energy deficiency in sport and um yeah well my you know my personal experience like i sort of touched on um toward the start is that um i did lose my period um and i lost it for i actually lost it for quite a few months um and you know now having a total awareness of that is i was one eating in a sufficient energy deficit and two overtraining like like something chronic um but what was the I suppose the most alarming thing with that is that it was kind of just shrugged off as oh well Mm -hmm. that's um you know I wasn't worried I was like oh okay I've lost my period like no big deal um that's fine (laughs) um no (laughs) no (laughs) um and you know disclosing that to um the sort of I suppose fitness people around me it was just like oh you know that's um that's just something that's happening for you. And I suppose that's the most alarming thing. And it's definitely incredibly common in, um, in those fitness scenes where people are, yeah, one, either training so much um, under eating or both as you've sort of touched on as well. And I think it's something that we absolutely need to um, address and talk about as well, because even conversations like this just bring awareness to the fact that that's a signal of something not quite going right within the body. Um, And unless we are aware of that, it's not something that we, you know, possibly are thinking about, I suppose. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. I'm a hundred percent with you that the menstrual cycle is, I recently heard it described as the fifth vital sign you know so besides heart rate and pressure and talks to us yeah it totally essential part of our clinical assessment like that's something that we do need to ask all female clients about if they are that age menstrual um, menstruating age because it does tell us a lot about absolutely um all kinds of things you know not just the negative energy balance if it's there but Mm. what might be happening cardiovascularly or yeah gut health Um, endocrine neurological health bone health it's Mm. just that that negative energy balance really hits all of those different areas and psychologically yes yeah it's um it's such a treasure trove of information I think um absolutely yeah and so I'm curious did 
like how did you get your period back was it yeah. only when you you stopped overtraining and started um, nutritional rehabilitation or how did that happen yeah well um so my experience coming out of uh, bodybuilding was very much like a um, just complete halt you know it was that experience of um, coming out of something so rigorous where I was just exhausted mm-hmm. and sort of like I spoke about, you know, that's where, um, I didn't move for some time too. Um, which is again, really normal, not something that I, um, was worried about at the time. I was like, man, I'm exhausted mm-hmm. and, um, food as well. It, um, I'm actually trying to remember Casey. Uh, it's, um, I'm fairly certain if my memory serves me correct, it, um, it came back not too long after I finished Mm. my comp, um, in the sense that as soon as I came out of my comp, I, um, was definitely meeting my energy requirements, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't quite remember it being too, too long after that. And by that, I mean, in the sense of a few months. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, um, I think it, it just, um, it came back. I suppose my, I, my memory isn't um, too strong with remembering that, but it, but, um, come back. it came back. It That's came back. Amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, it came <laughs> back. <laughs> Very fortunate. And yeah, yeah a, a testament to you, you know, mm. listening to your body again and, and giving it, the attention and care and compassion that it needed. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Monique, I've just got one or two more questions. Um, I feel like I just want to go down so many rabbit holes. In <laughs> I'm going to try to be strict with myself and keep to time, um, keep to the hour. I'm just wondering if, mm. you know, I know that you are a, a meditator and mm. a Vipassana meditator. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just wanting to hear a bit about your views on meditation and where you think that fits in with your work as a health practitioner, both as a dietitian and fitness professional. Oh my God, yes. Um, Are you familiar with Vipassana meditation? I've I've only done one 10 day sit. Oh, yeah. Um, I think we spoke about that last year. Yeah. And it's the hardest meditation (laughs) technique I've ever experienced. There's a reason I've only done one. (laughs) um, Yeah, I know that you're into it and I'm just, yeah. 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 So, um, so for partial meditation, basically it's an observation based self exploration journey, um, of an interconnection between the mind and the body through observation of physical sensations within the body. Um, so basically, uh, for anyone that is not familiar with it, it's yeah, that focused attention on the physical sensations of your body and your mind, I suppose, becoming so quiet that you can feel those subtler physical sensations of your body. Um, you know, so it's, there's no guided visuals. Um, there's no music playing. There's no laying down. You're sitting, excuse me. And um, yeah, it starts off like you just said, Casey, with a, you, ha- you have to go and do a 10 day course really to get acquainted with the technique because it is uh, quite in depth. It's a Buddhist technique. Um, and what's great though, is the 10 day course is donation based, which is beautiful because it makes it accessible to everybody. Um, and it's run completely off donations, which just makes you like, wow, you know, great things can happen with liberated people. (laughs) Um, and it's just amazing. So, um, yeah, you, you go away for the 10 day experience and, um, you know, you kind of look like a monk, I suppose, for 10 days, you're fed your food, it's all given to you freely. Um, and you sort of spend that time in silence, um, which includes not looking people in the eye because, you know, that's an exchange of energy. It's just really like being with you for 10 days. Mm-hmm. Um, and you just meditate. That's all you really do. Um, and yeah, when I, I did my first course about, I think five, maybe five ish years ago. Um, and it changed my life and continues to change my life. Um, and I go back, I go back every year to really get acquainted with the technique. And um, I will be the first to admit I'm um, still on that journey of getting a solid practice in my life regularly. But it's there, it's there, and you, vipassana meditation is something you can just tap into 
um, from the teachings that come just outside of sitting on your mat and, and meditating. Like it's, um, oh, it's just so beautiful. It's, it's honestly taught me so much. Um, and so anyway, the actual practice of it is right. Tuning into your physical sensations of your body. And I'm like, mind blown because intuitive eating is literally the interconnection between mind and body and tuning into the physical sensations of your body. (laughs) And so I'm like, wow, go Monique five years ago that went and did that because it certainly has helped me become an intuitive eater. And, you know, there's so much research around the fact that meditators have somewhat of an easier time becoming an intuitive eater because that connection is to the body is something familiar rather than that sort of starting off from scratch. Um, and so how it helps me as a practitioner, well, one, I think that meditating just makes me a happier person. Um, and two, the entire practice is centered around, um, compassion, non-judgment and awareness and equanimity. Mm. And to give an experiential of that in the practice is that, you know, um, physical sensations arise within the body that are pleasant or unpleasant. And the law of nature teaches us that that's, they arise to pass away. They arise to pass away. That's the law of nature. Everything is impermanent. Um, And so these physical sensations crop up. And when you're sitting for 10 hours a day, you have painful sensations and you have pleasant sensations. And it's really about starting to observe those sensations, which, you know, taken a long time to get to that point, obviously, um, where you observe those sensations that come up as just what they are, um, without holding attachment to it, you know, like say that that's deep, deep pain surging through your back, you know, that's an observation of that pain without attaching attachment in the sense of wishing that it would go away because that's an attachment that we draw in. That's a form of an attachment, you know, and of course, when you feel pain, you want it to go away. Right. Um, but this is that sort of, training of really just observing that it's there acknowledging it recognizing that it will pass away at some point and it will likely pass back at some point that's the law of nature it'll come and go so it's sort of really moving through those physical sensations and and on the contrary to that say it's a pleasant sensation that being you know might be say a pain-free body or a tingling sensation you know that's quite pleasant in a contrast to deep pain or heat surging through your body um, is also not growing attachment to that sensation of, Oh, you know, I just want this to stay. Like, I just want this feeling to stay. Like, this is so pleasant. Oh my God, stay. So I don't feel the pain, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's another attachment. So it's like this um, unbelievable uh, somewhat training, but more learning of the mind and how quick it is um, to attach I suppose some of those attachments there and you know I I really do believe that every um, emotion we have houses a physical sensation in our body and it's really big on you know going could cause some sankaras where you're getting to the those deeper layers or deeper roots of, of what that pain is and in the sense of how it helps me in that way as well as how I practice is one um helping people to become aware of their physical sensations Um, helps through that and and through the teaching of intuitive eating the journey that I take people on there is quite a lot of meditative stuff that comes up Um, so that's familiar to me because meditation is really familiar to me so it doesn't feel like a whole learning of a whole nother new world kind of Um, but more than that it's I suppose when it comes to some of those thoughts or feelings that come up around food I'm really big on that we don't necessarily go like oh man like why are these thoughts here I have to get rid of them but it's an acknowledgement that they're there and one I really think like you know of course they're there when everywhere that we turn at these messages from diet culture Mm -hmm. and it's that acknowledgement of sitting with that letting it wash over you um, and knowing that those feelings and emotions or thoughts arise to pass away again and they just come and they just go Um, Because I find that sometimes we can be really hard on ourselves in this journey um, or I see particularly in my clients of moving toward a positive place with their body and their relationship to food and having, um, you know, negative thoughts crop up to do with body or to do with food. And um, it's never, ever about them or feeling like frustration that they're there, which I find happens a lot, but rather 
hey, like this is there. I acknowledge that that's there. Mm -hmm. And um, this is why I'm feeling X, Y, Z. And, you know, the law of nature teaches us that things arise to pass away again. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I suppose in that sense as well, I suppose on that deeper level, it, it, it comes into so many different areas. Um, but I love it. I, yeah, I absolutely love the passion of meditation and what it's, um, what it's given me, I suppose, yeah. in my own life, um, even with the relationships of the people around me too. It sounds like you've got a really wonderful tool to tap into not only for your own personal mm. benefit and practice but for helping your clients Monique I mean mm. to be able to accept you know mm. just that, uh, even if it's only a partial acceptance that yeah acceptance yeah of what is and whether it's um that annoying tickling under my nose and I'm not allowed oh, to yeah. scratch or like a pain in my back that just makes me want to cry and I'm not allowed oh. to come up against the back wall because I get in trouble from the professional per- teacher which I experience um or <laughs> a, a a gnawing thought that's you know oh god your belly is sticking out of those pants yeah you can't wear those you know just being able to accept notice and accept those things and rather than automatically react to them yeah sit with the discomfort and know that it will pass and I guess with that acceptance and just that witnessing of of discomfort and and pain and suffering that we all feel we can start to generate that compassion and that self-compassion and all those delicious ingredients will only you know be of benefit to you and to your clients so yeah what a beautiful yeah. bit yeah it's great um it's really really great and it does have such a um I suppose just underlying teaching of, of compassion and for yourself too you know you're, you're learning something and and you're feeling things and, and you're being patient and your body is your body is like your tool in Vipassana meditation it teaches you everything what I love about that form of meditation and, and going away and having those courses as well is um you know well one you know this, but Goenka, who's the teacher of it, talks to you at night about the theoretical meanings behind the experiences you're experiencing within your body. So it's this beautiful um, combination of both theoretical and experiential experience. But you learn all of the learnings that come in Vipassana meditation actually literally come from your body. You know, I, I find that's what I love so much about the meditation is it's I'm learning from my body the whole time and I'm learning not to be, um, say, you know, possibly judgmental of my body of, you know, maybe I am feeling attachment to this thing right now. Oh, okay. That's interesting. That's, that's what's going on for me. Like, you know, it's, it's just observation of all of that. So, um, yeah, I think that that's what I love the most about it too, is it's so experiential. You're really actually using your vessel, to to learn from and for me personally I'm such an experiential learner that that's probably why it has influenced my life so much mm-hmm. yeah and if you can bring whether it's Vipassana or some other embodied um, technique into your experiences with food and eating I mean there's serious power there for you to really learn a lot in the moment about your body as you're saying yeah it's an experiential technique and that's something that I think as a western culture we're really we really don't focus on enough it's all about the learning and the head stuff and you know that stuff's great I I know you and I are both like yeah just continual education yeah nerds (laughs) Um, but yeah, balancing that out with the body-based stuff, I think is, is really, mm. is really healthy. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Monique, is there anything else that you wanted to add or touch on or talk to the listeners about today at all before we wrap up? Um, I don't, I don't think so. I think we've had a, an awesome chat. Also, I'm aware that if we start, we probably, <laughs> we probably won't stop, which we both know of us. Um, but I, I think we've, uh, yeah, pretty well covered it. Yeah. I think we've, we've had a bloody awesome conversation. It's been fun. <laughs> it has been. It's been really, it's been really inspiring for me, actually, Monique, like for someone who's, 
you know, you're, you're still relative, you're young still compared to me. <laughs> and so you've, you've only graduated not so long ago, but look at what you're doing. You're doing such incredible things um, in the non-diet space and just in the world. So thank you so oh, much I'm, for all your I'm time. absolutely um, still learning, learning on the process, but I've just also followed what my gut told me to do too. So I'm um, definitely big on that, I suppose. And it's definitely feels rewarding to be um, doing what I can do for sure, for sure. And we, we all benefit from you doing mm. that. So thank you. <laughs> many, thank many, you, Casey. Where can people find you if they want to want to hunt you down? Yeah, um, they can hunt <laughs> me down at... Um, uh, I've got an Instagram account, which is at the underscore intuitive underscore dietitian um, there. And that has all of the details on it already for my website and that sort of thing. But my website is also www.theintuitivedietitian.com.au. Um, but yeah, my Instagram sort of houses, you know, all of the links for everything else. So that can be a good place to hunt me down too. <laughs> That's a good um, launch pad, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Monique. Thank you so much for having me, Casey. Thank you. Thank you for being here and for straddling the tricky edges of yoga land and diet culture with me. I hope this podcast encourages you to compassionately and continuously question the ways that contemporary yoga is unfolding and interacting with other big forces in the world to develop a discerning mind and open heart and to skillfully dodge the diet BS that often comes along with studio culture. Like you, I'm eager to keep learning and sharing and I put all relevant links in the show notes. You can find my blog, online nutrition counselling services and lots more at funkyforest.com.au. While you're there, make sure to download my free ebook, A Modern Yogi's BS-Free Guide to Wellbeing. It's a light-hearted, easy read with my top six tips on dodging diet culture crap in the yoga world, whilst creating sustainable and balanced health from the inside out. If you love the podcast, please consider supporting my work at patreon.com slash non-dietyogi. There are some pretty rad rewards there, such as exclusive content, discount codes, giveaways, and the ability to chat with me. As more episodes roll out, I'll be adding even more fun bonuses, such as my non-diet yogi cookbook and mini courses. You can access most of the goodies at the lowest level, which is just $2 US a month or around $2.90 Australian dollars. Like most mummers, I'm ridiculously busy parenting, working, studying and all the rest. I've recorded a bunch of episodes and some of these have required five separate takes just to get a whole episode done as I need to wake up before my little ones to do it and they get up very early. So I'm crossing my fingers that the Patreon will give me the financial capacity to keep doing this. Another way to support is to head over to iTunes and subscribe and review the podcast. That would be so awesome. Thank you. The in and outro song is Evening Glow by John Anderson. Thank you so much for being here. Until next time. Mm-hmm.